And welcome back. I'm Robert Breaker. This will be our Sermon of the Week this week. The title is a little long, kind of like last week's, but got a lot of good stuff today for you. And I want to just go to Scripture and show you as much Scripture as I can. We're going to be looking at today how a lost person is, according to the Bible, what the Bible says a lost person is actually like. And then we're going to look at what the Bible says a saved person should be. And I'm going to ask the question, are you saved? And if you're not saved, why not? A lot of people today, they don't want anything to do with God. They say things like, well, it's my life, and I'll do what I want, and who are you to tell me what to do, and you know, things like that, and, and I'll do whatever I want. Okay, well, how does that work out for you? Uh, many people throughout the years have said that. What was the ultimate end of them? What was their life like? Were they happy? Did things turn out good for them with that attitude? Uh, well, that's what we need to look at today, and we need to see. So let's start today in 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And we're going to look at what the Bible says about the world and the people that are in the world. And we're going to look at what people are like who are not saved. What are lost people like? The Bible tells us. Now, I'm not doing this sermon to scare you, but if you're not a saved person, I want you to ask yourself, oh wow, am I like that? You might say, well, I'm not like all those, because there's a long list. But you know, one always leads to the other, and then to the next one, and then to the next one. And before you know it, you're going to be ending up being the type of person you never wanted to be, if you go down that road of sin. So we're going to look at this today, and I hope this is a blessing to you. I'm trying to bring you good news, but first we have to deal with the bad news. And the bad news is, people are sinners, and people do evil. And people do wrong. And I want you just to see what the Bible says is in the heart and in the mind of an unsaved person. I want you to see that. So starting in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, we're going to read verses 1 through 5. Then we're going to read verses 13 through 17. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Now the last days would be close to the time of the rapture and the tribulation and the beginning of the millennial kingdom. That would be the last days. So we are in the last days. We're waiting for the rapture of the church. And what does the Apostle Paul tell us about the last days? Well, it's not exactly good news. It's, hey, times are going to get worse. Perilous means dangerous. So in the last days, it's going to be dangerous. And we're already seeing an influx of that. We're already seeing crime increasing. We're already seeing fraud and corruption and, and murders rising in cities. And we're seeing just, just evil everywhere. Why is that? Verse 2, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, hmm. unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce. You ever see any fierce people out there? Despisers of those that are good. Wow, in the last days, not only are people going to be evil, they're going to hate those that are good. They will be so full of hate that they're going to hate good. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such, turn away. The Bible tells us who are Christians, we should try to get away from that. We should try to get away from them. We're not supposed to hook up with the heathen. We're not supposed to get together with the wicked ones. As Christians, we're supposed to be separated from the world and from evil. We shouldn't be like this. Let's get down there to verse 13. Well, actually, verse 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. The longer we live in this life and wait for the rapture, the more they'll begin to persecute Christians. And I wish it wasn't so, but it is. And the Bible tells us, verse 13, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. The Bible. Get back to the Bible. Back to the Bible or back to the jungle is the old saying. We don't want to get back there. We want to get back to morals and wholesome decency and goodness and purity and holiness. That's what we want. That's what made America great. If we could just get back to that. That's what made the world great. But now we see immorality everywhere and people doing evil. 
Then it says, verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Look at that. Scripture, Bible, is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Oh, that the world was instructed in the ways of God and of the Bible. That the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. So here's what the Bible says there. And verse 13, I think, is one of the saddest things. Look at it again, verse 13. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. This is Paul the Apostle prophesying of what will happen in the last days. And he says, I hate to say it, you know, but you think it's bad now. It's going to get worse. We've just gone through two years of this pandemic that they call it. And we've gone through all these things, people losing their jobs, uh, people... Uh, going through suffering, not being able to pay their bills, and things like this, and you think it's bad now. No, you, you've seen nothing yet. This is a cakewalk compared to what's coming next. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. So they will come even more people who are deceived and being deceived. I, I find that one of the most saddest verses in the Bible. Basically says, hey, guess what? Things are just going to get worse. And that's a sad thing. I don't want things to get worse. But why are they getting worse? Because people are emboldened in their sin, and people are becoming more sinful and more sinful and more sinful. Sadly, in our day, good men are attacked and ridiculed, while vile, wicked, ungodly, sinful men are exalted. What a shame. This only makes things worse and makes people want to be evil. The role models of many people today are the people that are the most sinful, and the children want to mimic that. So we're seeing people that are evil being exalted, and now others want to be like them. So people are going to get worse, according to the Bible. I hate that. I don't want that. I don't like a society like the Old West, <laughs> where people are out there just waiting to rob and, and kill and, and steal from you and, and even rape you and destroy you, and, and you're afraid to leave your house. I don't like a society like that. It's better to have a moral society where you're free to go outside. When I grew up, we didn't even lock the doors on our cars when we went to town. Try that nowadays, see what happens. It's a different world. Why? Because evil men and seducers are waxing worse and worse. Look at Psalms chapter 12 and verse 8. It's a sad, sad thing. But the Bible confirms what I just told you. It's going to get worse and evil men are being exalted. Look what it says in Psalms 12, 8. The wicked walk on every side, while the vilest men are exalted. Our society has gone away from being a society of morality and morals to a society of pure evil. And whoever is the most evil is the one that they put forth as the hero, as the one that they put forth as the person that you should be praising, and worshiping, and looking up to. That's not how it's been before. That's not how it should be. Our heroes should be the most righteous, the most honest, the most just. But instead, the most wicked and basest of men are exalted while the good are put down and attacked and ridiculed and mocked. Why is that? Because sin gives you a dirty heart. And the more people sin, the more their heart is hardened toward God and toward good and toward the things of the Bible. So we're living in a generation of hard-hearted people who are wicked, who are very wicked. Proverbs chapter 2, I'm going to read this to you. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 11 through 22. Look at what the Bible says. Discretion shall preserve thee. Understanding shall keep thee. To deliver thee from the way of the evil man, from the man that speaketh froward things. Froward meaning to turn aside from right. So the people that are going out there telling you don't do good, do evil, they're the evil ones. It says, verse 13, who leave the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness. That's what people are doing nowadays, leaving the paths of uprightness, and they're wanting to walk in the ways of darkness. Who rejoice to do evil and delight in the frowardness of the wicked. If that's not the world we live in today, I'll eat your dirty socks. People rejoice when people do evil, and they delight in seeing wickedness. Isn't that a shame? 
Verse 15, whose ways are crooked and they froward in their paths. To deliver thee from the strange woman, even the stranger which flattereth with her words, which forsaketh the guide of her youth and forgetteth the covenant of her God. For her house inclineth unto death and her paths unto the dead. None that go unto her return again, neither take they hold of the paths of life that thou mayest walk in the way of good men and keep the paths of the righteous. That's what God wants, that we walk in the way of good men, that we remember the guides of our youth, that we remember what our parents taught us and, and do right and live right. Verse 21, For the upright shall dwell in the land, and the perfect shall remain in it. But the wicked shall be cut off from the earth, and the transgressor shall be rooted out of it. You might sin and get away with it for a little while, but not forever. And the Bible teaches that someday Jesus Christ is going to come back. And he's going to get rid of the wicked. And he's going to be the righteous judge who will rule on this earth for a thousand years. So choose evil and enjoy your sin. But just remember, you'll give account of yourself. You can't get away with it. The Bible says, be sure your sin will find you out. And boy, I, I want to do right because I don't want... To be judged for evil. I don't want to do wrong. I don't, I don't want to do evil. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 15 real quick and read verse 9 through 11. Proverbs 15, 9. The way of the wicked is an abomination unto the Lord, but he loveth him that followeth after righteousness. Correction is grievous unto him that forsaketh the way, and he that hateth reproof shall die. Hell and destruction are before the Lord, how much more than the hearts of the children of men. So God knows your heart. God knows the hearts of men. God knows what they are like. God knows what they are thinking. God knows what they are feeling. God knows what they're going through. But also God sees their actions and sees the evil that they do. And God knows that. Well, what does God say in the Bible that lost people are like? Well, let's go over to the book of Romans chapter 1. Let me show you that God the all-knowing can see the heart of a sinner. And he sees the world we live in, and he looks inside, and this is what God says he sees in the heart of those who were lost. And I want to write it all up here, so let me do this. Let me just fade out and then fade back and after having written it all up here. And then we'll look at it uh, as we go verse by verse through this passage. We're going to be in Romans chapter 1, verse 28 through 32. So let me go ahead and write it up here, and I'll be right back. All right, so... I went up here and wrote down what we're about to read. And what a list. What a list. This is what God says that the lost are like. Now, why are they like this? Well, it's a heart problem. It's a problem with their heart. Their heart's not right with God. Romans chapter 1, and verse 28 through 32. Let's read this together. And then we'll go back and look at each one of these. But what a list. What a list. God in heaven wrote the Bible. A lot of people say, man wrote that book. No. No, men might have actually penned it, but it was the Holy Spirit in them telling them what to write. It was God's words. And so God is the one that tells us this is what sinners are like. In uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 28, we read, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Unbelieving, don't want to think about God. Wrong in their thinking. They're thinking of things that aren't right. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. So this is what God is saying about those kind of people. You say, well, uh, I'm not saved, I'm lost, I'm not like that. Well, you're one of those, or two, or three, or four, or five, or six, or, or maybe all those. Let's look at these. Unbelieving. If you're not saved, it's a sin. The Bible says without faith it is impossible to please God. 
wrong in their thinking. Are you thinking the way God would have you to think? He's the creator. He made you. He wants you to think a certain way. He wants you to think about good things. Are you thinking about evil things? Do you do things which are inconvenient? I looked up some of these words in the 1828 dictionary, and I, I just for fun, I looked up the word convenient. Convenient means suitable, proper, adopted to use or to wants. Commodious, followed by two or four, usually by four. So convenient, the word that stood out to me was proper. When I was a kid, I was taught there were certain things that you do that are improper. And you need to do right and don't do things that are improper. Are kids taught that nowadays? Or are they taught, do whatever you want, anything goes? I think we need to teach things that are improper and tell people don't do those things, that it's not right. Unrighteous, fornicators, wicked, covetous, malicious, envious. Okay, I looked up envy. To feel uneasiness, mortification, or discontent at the sight of superior excellence, reputation, or happiness enjoyed by another. To repine at an, another's prosperity. To fret or grieve oneself at the real or supposed superiority of another. And to hate him on that account. To hold a grudge and all this stuff. And I just thought to myself, boy, that sounds exactly like what our children are taught in schools. Like the social justice warriors. What this is, is it's communism. And communism teaches divide and conquer. And it's envy. And so communist says, oh, look, that guy, well, he has more than you. That's not fair. You should have that. <laughs> or uh, that person over there, why, why, they're more privileged than you. That's not fair. Well, you should, that's envy. Why don't you go get a job? Why don't you go work hard? And maybe you'll have what that guy has. You don't look at it and get all upset that he's got something that you don't. Envy is in the heart of a sinner. Murderers. Now, people say, well, I've never murdered anybody. Well, maybe not physically, but have you ever hated someone so much that in your heart you thought about, man, I wish that person was dead? That's committing murder in your heart, that you hate someone so much you wish they were dead. Do you know that's a sin? Do you know that's awful? Do you know that's wicked? And in God's eyes, you're a murderer, even though you didn't do it, but in your heart you thought about it. Debaters, it says. Only interested in making an argument. Deceitful, maligned, whisperers. Whisperers would be like a tattler. Malign, I look up malignity, or maligned, or as it says, malignity in our King James Bible. And I looked that up, and it, it says that has to do with extreme sinfulness. Someone that's full of, of that is someone that wants to go to an extreme with their sin. And that's malignity in the King James Bible. Envious, murderers, debaters, deceitful, uh, maligned, whisperers. Whisperer would be a tattletale, someone that's a tattler, going around uh, gossiping, if you will. Backbiters, haters of God. Look who is the one that's full of hate. Today we live in a world where certain groups of people try to say, oh, there's hate speech, there's hate speech. And they always say, and the Christians are the ones that are so hateful, and, and they're speaking the hate speech. And I go to the Bible, because I'm a Christian, and boy, I don't want to be guilty of hate. And the Bible says, no, no, it's these people that are the ones that are true haters, and are full of hate, because sin has tainted and deceived them into hating that which is good. And they hate God. They hate God. And then it says here, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things. That's the world we live in today. A lot of proud, prideful people boasting, making evil, wicked things to help them sin even more. Where does it all start? With disobedience to their parents. If you disobey your parents, you'll disobey God. It's that simple. Parents need to teach their children to obey them and to do right. Without understanding... That's the world we live in today. A lot of people that just don't understand right from wrong. Covenant breakers. What is a covenant? Well, our constitution that we have in our country is, is a covenant. I looked up the word covenant, and what does covenant mean? It's having to do with a, a written contract. Well, do people follow the law like they used to? Do people today follow the constitution? Or are they covenant breakers? Without natural affection, God in nature made Man and woman, 
and they have a certain type of affection. And many today, they're twisting that and changing that and, and wanting to, to have a different kind of affection that is really unnatural. Read chapter 1 of Romans for more on that. Implacable. I went to the dictionary and said, wonder what implacable means. So I went to the 1828 Webster's Dictionary. Not to be appeased. Okay? Someone that is a wicked, ungodly sinner who's not saved, they'll never be pleased. So they'll go and they'll sin more. They'll fornicate more. But it never fills that void in their heart. And they'll go do more sin and more evil and more wickedness. And they never are pleased. Implacable, not to be pleased, that cannot be pacified and rendered peaceable, inexorable, stubborn or constant in enmity, as an implacable prince, not to be appeased or subdued, in implacable anger, hmm, malice, such as malice or revenge. Boy, you know what that sounds like to me? That sounds like a lot of people in the world today. They go around, they're upset and they're angry, and all they want to do is scream and holler and say, it's all your fault, it's all your fault, and they call you names, and they judge you based upon what they think you are. They don't know you. If you get to know me, you know I don't want to be any of that. <laughs> I'll show you what I want to be, according to the Bible. But this is how people are that are lost. And they're so full of hatred and rage and anger that they lash out. Many times they hurt themselves. But what's worse is that they hurt others. And not only are they implacable, they are unmerciful. No mercy. Now verse 32, look what it says. Who knowing the judgment of God. They know that they're doing wrong. They know when they're doing wrong, but they don't care. Knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, so they know that they're doing bad things. They don't care. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. They enjoy sinning. They literally enjoy doing wrong. And they want to see others do wrong. It makes them feel good to see others do what they're doing, because then it appeases their conscience. And they say things like, well, everybody else is doing it, so it must not be that bad if everyone else is doing it. Um, if everyone else goes and jumps off a cliff, would you do it too because everyone else is doing it? <laughs> That's the question they always asked when I was a kid. And my answer is no. I don't want to go do what the world is doing because this is what the world is. This is who the world is. They do wrong and they don't care and they enjoy it. Does this scare you? It should. This is the world we live in. There's a lot of narcissists out there. And a world full of such people is not a good world. There's some people out there, and I've met them over the years, that are so naive. And they don't think that the world is really full of people like this. And they say things like, oh, you know, it's not that bad. And, and people aren't all that bad. No, it's not as bad as you think. Um, actually, it's far worse. You're living in a fairy tale world. Why don't you open your eyes and see just how evil and wicked people are and understand, wow, this is the world we live in. A lot of people say, no, the world's not that bad. The world's not that bad. Paul didn't say that. In Galatians chapter 1 and verse 4, he called it this present evil world. Now, there's always been evil. They killed Paul for no reason, put him in jail, and then murdered him, as they did many of the early apostles who were only going around teaching people how to do good and be honest and just and right and, and live for God and live for the fellow man to help people. They murdered them. These people did. They're murderers. So who are the bad ones and who are the good ones? Well, nowadays, they did the old switcheroo. If you're trying to do good, they say you're bad. Well, if you go over there and do what they're doing, which is bad, then they'll say, well, good for you. You're doing good. <laughs> The Bible says, woe unto them that call good evil and evil good. You're not supposed to do that. But this is the world we live in. And the Bible says, let's turn over to Romans chapter 3. The Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You might think, well, no, I'm not that bad. No, you're one of these. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. No one is good enough to get to heaven. And this is how God views people that aren't saved. Now you say, oh, I'm not all of those, I might be one or two. Well, you're still a sinner, and you come short of the glory of God. And that's what the Bible teaches. As a matter of fact, let's go to Romans chapter 3 and verse 10. Let's read some more of what the Bible says about lost people. This is why they need salvation. This is why they need forgiveness of their sins. This is why they need God. 
because they need to get away from this hurtful lifestyle of anger and hate and meanness and spite. That's what you become when you're lost, if you continue in the flesh. Romans chapter 3 verse 10 says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. Well, that sounds like over here. Without understanding, right there. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. Many of your lost people, they don't care about God. They don't look for God. They're not looking for salvation. They're all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is in their lips. There's your deceit. They're whispers. They're liars. They're lying. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Have you ever met somebody who's lost and every other word is a cuss word? My ears hurt to be around people like that. I can't take it. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Hmm. They want to kill people. They're murderers. Destruction and misery are in their ways. <laughs> yeah, when you live a sinful, wicked life, you're going to be miserable. You're going to probably feel sorry for your sin. And if you don't, you're going to just be living a life of trying to do more because there's this great void and you'll never be pleased and you're going to try to do more and more and more. And you literally enjoy doing others harm. Have you ever met someone like that? That lives just to make somebody else um, feel bad? Just to put someone down? It, it, it excites them to put others down? Have you ever met someone like that? That's horrible. But that's the lost world. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. How sad, but that's the world we live in today. The world is like that. And that's pretty condemning, very condemning. All have sinned. All are unrighteous. All are unprofitable, the Bible says. Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, look at what the Bible says. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What about life after death? Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about why we die? Well, according to the Bible, it's because of sin. The wages of sin, this is the sin, is death. And we all die. And someday we need to sit down and we need to think about, now what's going to happen after death? A lot of people, they don't think about that until it's too late. But have you ever thought about what happens when you die? What about after you die? What about after death? What if the Bible is true? What if there is a heaven and a hell? Where are you going? And why? Where will you spend eternity? Heaven or hell? Smoking or non-smoking? Well, if you're a sinner, you know where you end up, according to the Bible. And the Bible tells you you'll have to give account to God for your sins someday. You'll stand before God, and he'll go through everything you ever did in your life and say, now, why'd you do that? Now, why'd you do that? Now, why'd you do that? And you might say, well, you know, that's no big deal right now. But when you stand before a holy God who hates sin, and you have to stand before him and see every sin you've ever done, and he's sitting there looking at it and looking at you, don't you think you might feel a little embarrassed? Don't you think you might feel, I don't know, a little ashamed of yourself? And the things you did that hurt other people and hurt yourself? Have you thought about this? The wicked shall be turned into hell, the Bible says. That's where they end up. Now, that's the bad news. All right, up until that point, I give you a lot of bad news. You're a sinner without hope, doomed to face death, and afterwards judgment for your transgression. But that's not the end of this message. There is good news. And the good news is, Jesus Christ loved you enough, he died on the cross for your sins. And the good news is, he wants to forgive you. And you can find forgiveness of your sins through Jesus Christ. Let's go to Acts chapter 16. So a lot of people, they say, preachers, all they do is just give bad news, and they're bad news preachers, they just talk bad news, and they, they just say, everybody's going to hell, and all that. That's not what a preacher preaches, only. A preacher preaches a balanced message. This is you in the eyes of God, and because of that, you're condemned. But guess what? You can be saved, 
and forgiven of all this and have a place in heaven. That's the good news. You see, you got to have the bad news and then the good news. And the good news is you can go to heaven. You see, the good news is Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. So if you are a sinner, then guess what? You're qualified. You're qualified to sign up for salvation and get forgiveness of your sins. But it has to come through faith. The thing that damns a person to the lake of fire is the lack of faith. And the Bible tells us what our faith should be in. But let's read Acts chapter 26, verse 16 to 18. This is the Apostle Paul recounting Jesus speaking with him on the road to Damascus. And he's recounting and telling this story, and he tells what Jesus told him. Look at verse 16. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles to whom now I send thee. Now God tells Paul, Jesus says, Paul, here's what I'm doing. I'm sending you to this lost world of wicked people like this to do this. Verse 18, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. So God offers forgiveness, and it's all through him. And the question is, do you recognize yourself as God does, a sinner? And do you want to be forgiven of your sins? Or do you want to go down to that place and pay for them yourself? That's the question. You want to pay for your own sins for all eternity in hell? Or do you want to come to Jesus and receive him as your Savior by faith and be forgiven and now have a home in heaven? It's your choice. Now, how does he offer forgiveness of sins? Well, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 14 tells us, Colossians 1.14 says, it's through his blood. Colossians 1.14 says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Now the other verse says it's by faith. This verse says forgiveness is through the blood that Jesus shed on the cross of Calvary. So forgiveness through his blood. And forgiveness through faith. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's not our works that get us to heaven, because you already done those bad works. <laughs> Some people think, well, my good works outweigh my bad works, God will accept me. It doesn't work that way. The bad has already been done. It doesn't matter how much good you try to do to make up for the bad, God won't forgive you unless you come to Him for salvation. And trust in what he did for you. Because he died on the cross for your sins. He died in your place for your sins. He took your penalty for what you did on the cross. And the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 3 and verse 25 what the faith is to be in, what your faith is to be in, in order to be saved. Remember, we're saved by faith. Faith in what? Romans chapter 3 and verse 25, the Bible says, Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. So through faith in his blood, the Bible says. So do you want to be saved? It's by faith in his what? Blood. If you'll come to Jesus Christ and trust his blood atonement, and that's what it's about, it's the blood atonement of Jesus, then you'll be forgiven of all your sins. You see, what the Bible teaches is that it's only through a propitiation. The propitiation. Propitiation means the act of appeasing wrath. And the Bible tells us that the wrath of God someday will be poured out upon these wicked sinners. And that's what hell is. It's the wrath of God. But look what it says in Romans chapter 5 and verse 9. Well, actually, let's back up to verse 8. Actually, let's back up to verse 6. Romans chapter 5 and verse 6. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. All these are the ungodly. And yet Jesus died for their sins because he wanted them to be saved and forgiven and be with him for all eternity in heaven. 
Verse 8, but God commended his love toward us. Look at that. It's all about his great love. These people, what are they all about? They're all about hate. When you get Jesus, you don't hate, you love. And it says here, but God committed his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. That wrath is hell. You don't have to go to hell. Jesus took your hell for you. And now you can be saved if you'll trust in his blood atonement. Look at verse, um, verse 10 and 11. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. There is joy in salvation. Knowing, oh, I'm saved from hell. I'm not going to hell. I'm saved because I've come to Jesus and I've trusted his blood for salvation. And now I know I'm forgiven of all my trespasses. It's through his blood atonement. So have you received the atonement, as the Bible says? If you do, you get joy. And you'll be joyful. You'll be happy in knowing, hey, man, I'm saved. Well, here's what the saved should be. Saved should be. And the Bible tells us that this is what you can be through Jesus Christ. First and foremost, happy. You can be happy in knowing that your sins are forgiven and you're on your way to heaven. Are you happy? Let's go to Galatians chapter 5. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 1.13 that when you're saved, the Holy Spirit comes inside you. And is sealed inside of you. And so you have God, the Holy Spirit, dwelling in you, the Bible teaches. What a wonderful thing that is to be a Christian. And the Holy Spirit helps you to not be like that. So I'm so thankful that I got saved and that I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, as it says in Ephesians 1.13. Now, Galatians chapter 5, the Bible talks about the fruit of the Spirit. Look what it says. Actually, let's back up in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 19. And look at verse 19 through 21. This is the works of the flesh. This is what the flesh wants. Galatians 5, 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred. You know, who are the haters? They try to say, hate speech. Christians are, are always guilty of hate speech. No, we don't hate anyone. We love you as Christ loved you. The ones that are most often full of hate are those that have their heart hardened by sin. And those are the hateful ones. Those that are in the flesh. When we're saved, we're in the spirit. And it says, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay? What is the kingdom of God? Well, it's salvation. And it's a spiritual inheritance with salvation that you receive after the rapture, when you get rewards in heaven. So if you're saved and you're doing some of these things, you're going to lose rewards in glory, unfortunately. But if you're saved, you've already inherited the kingdom of God. But look what it says in verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, as opposed to badness. <laughs> Don't be bad, be good. Faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. So, a Christian should be happy, should be loving, should be full of joy, okay? Should be joyful. A Christian should further have peace. So he should be peaceable. Christians don't go around in riots and burn down cities. Christians don't run around and, and, and do bad things like that. We want peace. 
We're to be long-suffering. I've known many Christians in my life and how long-suffering they are to put up with so much as Jesus puts up with us. Now, Jesus doesn't want us to sin, but by His grace, when we do sin, He puts up with it. He doesn't give us what we truly deserve. But if you die in your sin, yes, you get what you deserve. Gentleness. Goodness. Goodness. Faithfulness. Oh, let me spell this right. Faithfulness. Christians should have faithfulness. What else? It says there, meekness. Meekness. And then the last one is temperance. Temperance. What is that? Well, that has to do with self-control. A Christian should be of a good temperament. Of a good temperament. Let's see. I know there's an A in there somewhere. Temper. Temperament. Ment. Okay, I think it's temperament. M-A-N-T. I hope I spelled that right. So this is what a Christian is supposed to be like. And what a difference between people who are like this and people who are supposed to be like this. Now, I say supposed to be. Are all Christians like that? A lot of people in the world say they're Christians. And yet, many of them are doing some of that over there. Does that mean they're not Christians? Well, it could. It could mean they weren't saved to begin with. They've never trusted in the blood of Christ, so they're lost. Or it could be they're saved, but they're walking in the flesh and not in the spirit, and they're losing rewards in heaven by doing some of these things. But according to the Bible, Christians shouldn't be like the lost world. They should be different. They should have the fruits of the Spirit, and they should live for the Lord, not for the flesh. Let's go over to 1 Peter chapter 1. A Christian should be holy. Now, do you know what holy means? Holy means separated and sanctified. Sanctified means cleansed or cleaned up. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13 through 16, so a Christian wants to be clean. These things are dirty. People with a dirty heart tell dirty jokes and do dirty acts. People who want to be clean try to have a clean mouth and a clean heart and a clean body and try to live right. But look what it says in 1 Peter 1.13. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay? Notice, Christian's mind, the Bible says we have a renewing of our mind. Someone's not saved. What's wrong? They're wrong in their thinking. They're given over to a reprobate mind. Getting saved is wonderful. Now you can think. A lot of people just do bad things without thinking. When you get saved, a lot of times you think first, and you should. And it says here in verse um, 14, As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. So be ye holy. So what's a Christian supposed to be? Holy. Holy means I want to be different than the world. I want to be clean. I want to be sanctified. I want to be set apart. I want to serve Jesus rather than serving Satan or the flesh. And so that's what a Christian should be. Now, let's go to Romans chapter 12. I'm going to show you some other things that a Christian is supposed to be. And uh, we live in a, a day and age of people that claim to be Christians, but many of them are worldly. Many of them have one foot over here and one foot over here, if you will. Many of them may very well be saved through faith in the blood of Jesus, but they're doing some worldly things, and that shouldn't be. We also have a lot of other ones who claim to be Christians, but they're not. In name only, they say, I'm a Christian, but they've never trusted the blood. They're trusting in their own works, and they're living like this. And they keep falling into sin. And they can't figure it out. Why am I keep falling back into sin? Well, maybe you never got saved to begin with. So what I want you to do today is I want you to think about who are you and are you saved? Because Jesus saves and he can save you from hell and from your awful sin. Romans chapter 12, verse 17 and 18. Romans 12, 17 says, Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lies in you, live peaceably with all men. So what's a Christian supposed to be? Honest. I want to be someone 
who is trustworthy, who's dependable, who's honest. I want to be someone that you can look up to and trust in. I don't want to be someone that's just walking around thinking, who can I prey upon? And who can I uh, look at as a mark that I can take something from? Christianity is all about giving. Christ gave his life. Satan is all about taking. And the world that's unsaved, they all want to take something from you. Take your purity in many cases, unfortunately. Philippians chapter 4, verse 7 through 9. Here's what a Christian should be like. Philippians 4, 7. And the peace of God which path is all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Wow. So the Apostle Paul tells us to be a certain way. And this is God speaking through him, telling us to be honest and true, to be just, to be pure, to be lovely. All right? It's not just the outside that's beautiful. Inside is the most beautiful thing. To be good or, or of good report. When people talk about you, do they say, oh, that's a good guy you can depend on, and he's reliable, or do they go, oh, that guy, well, he does this and says that and does another thing, and he lies, and he tells false truths, and, and he's unreliable, and he gets drunk all the time, and he does, I mean, what, what do people say about you? What is your testimony? Virtuous. Virtuous. Let me spell it right. Virtuous. Virtuous. Okay, and... Virtuous. All right, I don't know how to spell virtuous, so I will just say of virtue. How's that? <laughs> Sometimes I'm up here and my mind doesn't work. I can't think. Uh, how do you spell virtuous? But be virtuous, praiseworthy. When people look at you, do they look up to you or do they look down on you? Because they look at you as, oh, you're evil. Oh, you're wicked. Oh, you're a bad person. I, I don't want to be around you. What do you like? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, I'm almost done. I just want to give you as much scripture as I can. I want you to see what the world is really like. And I want you to see the need that the world has for salvation. 1 Thessalonians 5, 14. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly. Comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. So don't do evil. Don't do it wicked. Be a good testimony. I want the world to see that not everyone is like them. I want to have a good testimony and be a person that people say, Wow, how come you're so different? Well, let me tell you, Jesus made me this way. I was born again, and this is how uh, I turned out after I got born again spiritually. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. Let's read verse 22 to verse 32. Ephesians 4, 22. That you put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. This is corruption. The lost are corrupt. I don't want to be corrupt. Maybe, just maybe, this is why when we look at the political world we see a lot of corruption in politics. Because most likely, the people in politics are lost people. Very few people that are politicians that are true Christians. That are trusting in the blood of Jesus. Because if they were saved, they'd be talking about Jesus and how wonderful it was to be saved by his blood. But they never mentioned that. Wow, what an interesting thing. And then it says here, um, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. That's a lost person. They have deceitful lusts. Verse 23, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, put away lying. Speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Now, this isn't anger because of hate. This is what the Bible calls righteous indignation. It's okay to be angry when you see sin. 
but don't lash out, don't attack, don't recompense evil for evil. But it is okay to say, man, I, I don't like seeing evil. That's called righteous indignation. Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more. But rather let him labor working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed until the day of redemption. Now look at this. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Malice has to do with hatred. Hatred with a vengeance. That's malice. And be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. So we that are Christians, we're supposed to be different than the lost worlds. We're supposed to be very different. And this is how we're supposed to be. If you're watching this and you're saved, is that you? Or maybe you're still doing some of the former man things. Some of the things that you used to do before, are you still meddling with those? Or are you putting that behind you and pressing on for Jesus? Now, if you're not saved, why aren't you saved? Why don't you come to Jesus Christ? Are you saved? If you're not saved, why don't you get saved? Let's close with Philippians chapter 3. Greatest day of my life was the day I got saved. July 29th, 1992. Before that, I was a religious lost zealot. I thought I had the right religion and I thought I was a good person. But yet I'd cry myself to sleep at night thinking about the sins that I'd done. And I thought to myself, man, I don't know if I'll go to heaven, and, and I just I can't seem to do right. I always seem to be falling into sin. What's wrong with me? And then my daddy came on July 29th, 1992, and he sat me down, and he showed me in the Bible what the gospel is. The gospel is 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, and he showed me how to be saved. And that day, around 10 o'clock in the morning, I trusted the blood of Christ for the forgiveness of my sins. I trusted Christ as my Savior through faith in his blood. And I was born again. And my life has never been the same. I don't want to do those things anymore. I want to be what I'm supposed to be according to the Bible as a Christian. And I would encourage you to want to be the same. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 13. Paul says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Don't do that. Put it behind you. Forget it. Do this. Live for Jesus. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. Isn't that interesting? Our minds should be this way. Their mind's not thinking right. Our mind is thinking correctly. Hey, Jesus did something for us. Now we need to do something for him. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded, and if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereunto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. Paul says, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Paul says there are people that aren't saved that are the enemies of Christ. He says, I cry for them because I love them and want to get saved. Where's the hatred? There's no hatred, only love. Please come to Jesus and get forgiven and go to heaven. Don't continue in that and end up in hell. Verse 19, for those who are the enemies of Christ that, that aren't saved, Paul says, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame who mind earthly things. Hmm. Don't be one of those people. Get saved, and then you can have this. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence we also look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it might be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. The rapture, a glorified body, when Jesus comes. Are you saved? Or are you one of these? You need Jesus. You need the forgiveness of sins. You need to come to him and be forgiven and go to heaven. Otherwise, you're going to be judged by him. And you'll go to the other place. Are you saved? 
You say, yeah, Brother Breaker, I'm saved. All right? Are you a good example? And are you looking up? Are you spiritual, walking in the Spirit? Or are you walking in the flesh? Are you carnal Christian? Are you a good example or testimony of Jesus? Or a bad one? It's up to you. What I tried to do today was show you the difference between what a lost person is like and how a saved person is supposed to be. And it's up to you to decide how you're going to live your life. Because someday you'll give account to God for it. Someday your destiny will begin. Eternal damnation or eternal bliss with Christ in heaven. The choice is yours. Come to Jesus today for salvation. And if you are saved but you're not doing right, come to Jesus and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I want to do right. And get right and be a good testimony. Thank you for watching. Lord willing, we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.